and welcome to She Thinks, a podcast where you're allowed to think for yourself. I'm your host, Beverly Hallberg, and on today's episode, we delve into the topic of occupational licensing and how burdensome regulations have impacted the industry of interior design. We'll also discuss how the entrance of COVID-19 has had serious impacts on the industry. But before we dive in, IWF does know that many Americans are facing unprecedented challenges due to COVID-19 and that it's more important than ever to show what America is made of. IWF is highlighting American ideals of ingenuity, generosity, and kindness. From everyday Americans donating blood to companies providing free food and housing, it's a beautiful reminder that we're in this together. Visit IWF.org or check us out on Facebook and Twitter and follow our campaign using hashtag in this together that is hashtag in this together to learn more and now to our guest our guest today is brian suka brian is the vice president of government and public affairs for the american society of interior designers he leads the society's strategic efforts to advocate for the interior design profession from a legislative regulatory and policy perspective before the federal and state governments he is a society's sole registered federal lobbyist and chief advocate at the state and local level Brian, it's a pleasure to have you on She Thinks. Thank you so much, Beverly. Great to be here with you. Uh, We're really excited about this interview. You know, more than 80% of the interior design profession are women. More than 80% of the firms that interior designers represent and work at are small businesses with four or fewer employees. And more than 83% of those firms are women or minority owned. So we think this is a, a really great opportunity to get our story out there. So thank you for having us. Oh, well, we appreciate it. And I want to start us off by just giving the definition of occupational licensing. Occupational licensing is a form of government regulation requiring a license to pursue a particular profession or vocation for compensation. So as we mentioned, and as you just said, you work in the industry of interior design. Can you kind of just give us some background for those of us who are not aware of how much licensing is required for somebody to pursue this profession? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, interior design, uh, it's generally not what you see on television on a daily basis. Um, interior decoration is a very important part of interior design, um, making spaces look aesthetically pleasing and look ple- pleasing to the, uh, to the owner, um, to the organization where you're designing that space is very important. But interior design goes way beyond just the aesthetic. Um, Interior design really came into its own as a profession about 100 years ago um, with residential decoration in about the 1920s. Um, And from the 1920s to 1940s, that really expanded into the commercial spaces, starting with corporate offices in the 1950s and the 1960s. Um, Over the course of the 70s and 80s, as interior designers started practicing in more public spaces, convention centers, hospitals, hotels, um, the education, the private education, the private examination and training requirements really expanded. Um, So the profession today is a much more building uh, sciences-backed profession than it was probably 100 years ago and probably what many folks are used to seeing on television. Um, Interior designers are required to complete formal post-secondary education. They're required to complete uh, thousands of hours of paid supervised experience and an 11-hour internationally recognized exam before they can become privately certified uh, by the Council for Interior Design Qualification. Um, And this, again, is a private certification. This is not a uh, state-level certification. Um, Unfortunately, though, interior designers do work in very highly regulated spaces. Um, Again, the work that they're doing on a daily basis is aesthetic, but it's also um, involved with the regulatory system of the construction industry. So we're talking about the building codes. We're talking about Americans with Disabilities Act requirements. Um, You know, when an interior designer moves a wall, uh, let's say you're an interior designer uh, who wants to turn a uh, corporate boardroom into private offices talking about COVID and how we're going to be working in um, more secluded spaces these days. An interior designer is qualified to actually put up that non-load-bearing wall to turn that conference room into two, uh, two uh, private offices. Uh, and, of course, that affects egress. So how do you get out of a, uh, of a workspace uh, if there's an emergency? That affects the occupancy loads. Um, so unfortunately, when interior designers do that work, um, they have to go and get their building permits, um, their plans approved for a building permit. And unfortunately, uh, in only 11 states, uh, due to some of these onerous uh, licensing uh, requirements, regulatory requirements for other professions like architects and engineers, uh, only in 11 states do interior designers have the ability to obtain those building permits. So in most states, interior designers actually have to go, because of the architect statute license, 
the engineer statute and license, the interior designer actually has to work under what's called the responsible control of the architect or engineer, have that architect or engineer review their work, and then use the architect's uh, construction document stamp. And only then can the interior designer can go take their construction documents to the building office, to the permit office, uh, to obtain their building permits for their clients. So it's a very bureaucratic system. Um, it's a very outdated system. Obviously, architecture and engineering are much older professions that uh, came of age in the United States and became regulated in the United States when licensure really was the only path to professionalism. Um, and so interior designers, unfortunately, have to work under that space. Um, and again, because only 11 states allow them to work independently, uh, the, the current regulatory system is, is a real burden and barrier to entry for many interior designers across the United States. And I'm glad you gave some explanation of that. I think when most people, I know I include myself in this, when I think of interior design, I don't automatically think of somebody needing to move a load-bearing wall, which obviously would need permitting to make sure that it's done correctly. But do you find that there are plenty of people who work in this industry who aren't working on that aspect of it, meaning they're not moving walls, they're not dealing with structural integrity, they're actually just working with a space that's already there um, and updating it? Is this something where you find that everybody is lumped into the same category or there is there really a variation in the type of requirements that are asked depending on what type of interior design someone is doing absolutely and just to clarify even the most um, qualified interior designers are not working within the structural realm they're not moving load-bearing columns they're not moving load-bearing walls they're moving non-load-bearing uh, walls um, they're doing ada compliance they're calculating occupancy they're doing fire safety so they are doing regulated work that is governed by the health, safety, welfare of the public, uh, but it is not load-bearing, it is not seismic. But certainly, yes, insurance design is a very, very broad profession. Um, you have everybody from folks who just on the weekends are doing residential decoration for friends, all the way up to people who actually hold PhDs in interior design, uh, who have studied uh, you know, uh, everything as far as construction and design is concerned, everything from, um, again, fire safety, Americans with Disability Act and accessibility, and everything in between. Um, and that's why the profession has decided that as we go around to the states to try to get interior designers the ability to independently work without having to work under an architect or engineer, that we do not want to pursue full restrictive licenses. What the interior design industry promotes and, and, and respects is the ability for interior designers, those interior designers who do want to work in the regulated spaces, those interior designers who do require building permits because they're moving a wall or they're locating um, emergency lighting or a fire uh, extinguisher cabinet, that those interior designers have the ability to voluntarily register with the state so that they can obtain their uh, construction document permit. For those interior designers who enjoy working under an architect or engineer or another registered interior designers, or for those interior designers who, again, are just working in the residential space, the decorative space, um, we do not feel that the state should be requiring these folks to uh, gain a license or, or restrict the title interior designer. Um, again, it's a very broad uh, category. The American Society of Interior Designers, uh, the organization that I represent, represents everybody from your interior decorator all the way up to your, um, your doctorate interior designers. So uh, we believe in opening the marketplace. We believe in, in bringing everybody who's interested in good design into the marketplace, but certainly allowing the ability for those interior designers with the qualifications um, to have the ability to independently work without an architect or engineer over their shoulder. And you gave the stat earlier about how many women work in this industry. So I'm assuming when you see this, you see women who are definitely impacted, who maybe have skills, but like you said, don't need to get all of the licensing depending on the style or the type of interior design that they're doing. Do you see and do you hear from a lot of women out there who are struggling with the cost of going through all the steps they need to take to be qualified or get that permit or get that license to do what they're doing? Do you hear from women quite a bit? Well, again, fortunately, the interior design profession, as we've gone to, from state to state to try to obtain these abilities, these extra business rights, um, we have not supported in recent years the, the full restrictive license. So um, thankfully, we haven't heard from many practitioners um, who feel that the current regulations for interior designers are onerous. They might feel that the, um, the regulations for architects or engineers in relation to interior design might be onerous, but not that interior design, those regulations for interior design uh, are onerous. Um, we hear more about the complaints from interior designers, and I believe IWF recently uh, interviewed one of our members, Robin Strobel, and I was reading IWF's um, article with Robin the other day. We hear more complaints from the Robin Strobels of the world, who uh, Robin owns a small business in Wisconsin. 
Uh, it's a small interior design business in Wisconsin. And she wants to be able to work independently to be able to take her project from inception through drafting, through obtaining her permits for her clients, all the way through completion with the general contractor who was ever actually doing the construction. And we hear complaints from those practitioners because right now they have to go pay an architect or pay an engineer uh, to use their construction document stamp. Um, you know, it adds bureaucracy to the process. It adds time to the process. And it also adds cost to the process because interior designers are either paying it out of their own pockets or the pockets of their business to obtain, uh, you know, this review and, and stamp by architects or engineers, or they're passing that, unfortunately, on, on to the client. Um, so it's raising prices for construction. It's raising costs for construction. And really, we don't believe based on the private education, uh, certification, experience, and examination uh, that, that that needs to happen. So really, where we're hearing the complaints from our practitioners are from the lack of the ability uh, based on these other licensing laws to, to complete their work. And I want to take time here to let our listeners know about a new campaign that you just mentioned, Brian, that I want to let people know where they can find more information. The campaign is called Chasing Work. It is a storytelling campaign which educates us on how over-regulating employment locks workers out of opportunity. So there are stories of men and women, just like the woman you mentioned, um, Brian. So people are interested in learning about their stories. They can go to IWF.org backslash Chasing Work. That is IWF.org backslash Chasing Work. And so, Brian, I want to I want to pick up on that. I know that you you, you talk about how you're trying to help. Um, is it women like Robin that you just mentioned there? Do you see that states are trying to push reforms that will help people in her situation? Are are you seeing progress on this front? You know, we we hope so, and we're certainly working in in many states. We were very lucky in Nebraska to have a great effort behind a recent effort. Um, to gain these uh, practice and business rights for interior designers. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get the bill across the finish line. Um, but we saw great outreach from uh, the Platt Institute out in, in Nebraska and former state Senator Laura Ebke, uh, who worked with her colleagues to, um, to bring this issue to light. Again, so many times when, when you think of interior design, you don't think that an interior designer needs a, uh, a, a permit or any sort of regulation. And again, most forms of decoration, some forms of interior design does not require any sort of regulation whatsoever. But for their ability to obtain those permits, um, you do need a little bit, of, uh, you, need, you do need some sort of government oversight to obtain that stamp and seal. But we were very lucky in Nebraska to get, um, you know, a great outpouring from the legislature, a lot of people who were very interested and supportive of our topic. And we've seen that in other states, Wisconsin, North Carolina. So we do see people's eyes opening uh, to the idea that an interior designer is more than just a decorator and can do a lot of the same work that an architect or, or engineer can do. And that it's about consumer choice, really, when you think about it. Um, you know, instead of a consumer just having to go to an architect, they're not touching anything load-bearing, an interior designer can now, uh, excuse me, a consumer can now go to an interior designer uh, to do that work. Um, but just like most, uh, most of these cases, you know, looking at the medical field and, and some of these other fields, uh, there does seem to be that bit of a turf war um, component when when talking about architects and engineers and interior designers. Now, we necess we personally don't think that this is about a turf war. Um, when we are looking to expand what an interior designer can do under the regulated system, we don't want to take that away from an architect. We don't want to take that away from an engineer. We want engineers and architects to be do able to do everything they're able to do today under the current system. All we want is for interior designers to do what they are educated, trained, and tested to do. There have been some easing of requirements in certain areas of work during COVID-19 and during this pandemic. We can take a look at some of the health and safety requirements, um, medical professionals who are now allowed to operate over state lines. Do you see that a trend to the, the trend to ease restrictions on licensing and people being able to do their profession? Do you think that could filter into this industry as well? You know, we, we certainly hope so. And you mentioned the medical uh, the medical field being able to practice or more professions in the medical field be able to practice independently during COVID-19. We certainly hope to see that. Uh, you know, fortunately, in many states, construction and construction-related services were deemed essential services. Um, and that's really important. And it makes sense because you saw in many states um, structures like arenas and convention centers uh, being converted into field hospitals. And that sort of space planning is something that an interior designer could and would, would do. Um, you also see perhaps doctor's offices that are changing their space planning uh, to protect the healthcare workers as well as the patients. So it's definitely something that we think uh, lends itself to this deregulatory movement in response to COVID-19. We certainly think that after COVID-19 is behind us, we're going to see 
several um, residential and commercial clients looking for more efficient ways to create and change interior response uh, spaces. And, you know, I just said earlier, this is our issue is really about consumer choice. And we think in response to COVID-19, when you're looking at how do we change corporate offices, uh, we've seen a trend over the last 20 years in interior design of open office plans. Um, we think we're going to see a trend now away from that when we think about social distancing, um, material selection. In nine out of every 10 commercial and residential pro uh, projects, an interior designer, not the architect, not the engineer, is the one that is specifying uh, both products and materials. Uh, and looking at materials, we see antimicrobial materials. We see certain natural materials that uh, kill germs on contact. Um, so we certainly think there's going to be a marketplace uh, and, and a desire amongst the market uh, to see uh, more interior design, better interior design, more healthy interior design as we change the, the spaces we live in. We spend 90% of our lives inside, and we certainly think that um, our homes and our public office spaces, restaurants, hotels, uh, hospitals, airports, all these public spaces where we, we are now going to need to see social distancing and we're going to need to see different, um, different sorts of, sort of space planning. Uh, we think those are really all going to change and hopefully prompt a move towards deregulation of the industry where interior designers uh, can work more freely and openly because they will definitely be contributing uh, to the changes in these interior spaces as we move forward. And that leads me to my last question for today, and that is, how are interior designers doing during COVID-19? A lot of the states have opened up, but you have you have bigger cities like New York, Washington, D.C., et cetera, where there's still shutdowns in order, certain states where shutdowns are still in order. Do you find that a lot of people in this industry have been struggling during this time? Absolutely. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, more than 80% of interior design firms are not multinational firms. They're not these huge firms that are working in London and Hong Kong and, and all around the world. They're small businesses of four or fewer employees. Um, and just like most small businesses, um, during COVID-19, they are struggling. We have something at ASID called the Pulse Survey, uh, which every two weeks surveys our members. And we're certainly seeing some downturn in the construction economy. We're seeing um, folks not building new and not renovating their spaces while um, a lot of people are out of their commercial spaces and their office spaces during COVID-19. Um, you know, we've seen other problems that are associated with COVID-19 for these small businesses as well. Um, most importantly being uh, that they can't access construction sites. Most construction sites in states where construction work isn't deemed essential, um, interior designers can't get to their construction sites to work with their clients to do the fit outs of these spaces. So um, certainly we're seeing a downturn. Uh, I think we're starting to see it now an upswing as we start to move out of COVID-19. Uh, but again, this is, you know, everything we talked about today, it's, it's all about small businesses. It's all about making sure these small businesses can not only recover from COVID-19, um, but, but can contribute to the economy in their states and nationally and give consumers more choices when it comes to designing construction work. And as you were saying there, hopefully there will be a lot of work for interior designers as we're changing the way people are working and living, maybe going from those open concept offices to something that is more social distance appropriate could lead to a lot of work for interior designers once everything gets opened up. So Brian, we so appreciate your work on this and standing up for so many workers across the country who just want to make a good living for themselves. So we appreciate you helping them do that. Thank you so much, Beverly. Really appreciate your time. Really appreciate your listeners. And uh, let us know if we can con contribute any other way in the future. And thank you for joining. Before you go, Independent Women's Forum does want you to know that we rely on the generosity of supporters like you. An investment in IWF fuels our efforts to enhance freedom, opportunity, and well-being for all Americans. Please consider making a small donation to IWF by visiting iwf.org backslash donate. That is iwf.org backslash donate. Last, if you enjoyed this episode of She Thinks, do leave us a rating or review on iTunes. It does help. And we'd love it if you shared this episode so you can let your friends know where they can find more She Thinks episodes. From all of us here at Independent Women's Forum, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.